Um, so I was given the topic of compassionate leadership, and I'll say a bit about leadership in general and a bit about what I mean by compassionate leadership. And there is a literature uh, now developing on compassionate leadership, which is a very interesting topic. So I'm very grateful for the invitation to be here. Um, uh, Kim Solomon has become a friend of mine over the years. This is the second time I've spoken at this uh, symposium. The first time was in 2017 in this same hall. And that, at that time, I was working in Hong Kong. So this time, I've traveled a little bit further to be here uh, across some more time zones. But it's a great pleasure to be back. And I feel the same as I did when I was here seven years ago, looking at you. Because I look at you, and I have two feelings about looking at you. One is envy. I envy you because you're young and you're at the start of your careers, whereas I'm old and I'm at the end of my career. Uh, and I also look at you uh, with uh, excitement because I feel that in this hall, there are people that are going to change the world. I don't know which of you it is, but it will be some of you. So get to know that person that's sitting next to you because they might turn out to be a world leader in the future and they may be a very useful contact for you. So this group of people selected by your universities uh, and your governments to be here is a highly selected group of talented people and you're going to do interesting things in the world and I hope I'm around long enough to be able to, uh, to see some of them. So um, this is the outline of the talk that I'm going to give you. I'm going to talk a little bit about leadership in general uh, and then specifically about compassionate leadership in particular. I'll give you some definitions, although as I'm going to go on and say, definitions are quite controversial and quite difficult sometimes. Um, I'll talk about one or two myths and I'll talk about one or two cultural contexts. Um, uh, one question I want to address is whether leadership can be taught or not. There's a big literature on this. I happen to believe that leadership can be taught as long as those people that are being taught are willing to learn. So there's a difference between being taught and learning. I think leadership can be learned and it can be learned from programs and textbooks and inspiring examples uh, and it can also be learned by your own experience, by observing others. Um, I asked myself when I was thinking about this talk, am I a compassionate leader? Uh, I'll try to answer that question. I hope as I speak, you might be giving the same thought. Are you a compassionate leader? Whatever it is you're doing at the moment, are you aware of what it means to be a compassionate leader? And are you trying to put those things into practice? I'll say a little bit about compassion for leaders as well as from leaders, because this is another interesting topic. So um, uh, leaders uh, sometimes um, uh, demand compassion, but don't deliver it themselves. And so therefore, uh, there's an example, a sort of leading by example, a question there, which I'll illustrate. Um, I'll say uh, a, a couple of things about when leadership goes wrong, because it often does. Um, uh, and there are lessons that can be learned. There. And then I have some suggestions for you, for your own development as leaders of the future. So that's roughly the categories that I'm going to talk to you about. And I'm aiming to leave uh, plenty of time for questions. So I've set myself a timer. And if the timer goes off, I need to shut up. So the University of Edinburgh is old. It was founded in 1583. This is a picture of the building in, uh, in University of Edinburgh where my office uh, sits. Um, and in, 50, in the 440 years since the university was founded, I'm the 35th principal. Um, and none of the previous 34 has been uh, a woman or a non-white man. So I'm the 35th white man to hold this office. Um, I confidently predict that the 36th principle will not be a white man, but I hope it won't be yet. So my uh, own story, I'll just illustrate very briefly. So um, I, I'm a medical uh, graduate by background. So I studied medicine in London, at uh, part of the University of London, London Hospital Medical College. And I specialized in kidney medicine, which is, in my opinion, easily the most interesting branch of medicine, but that's a topic for another day. Um, I then went to Cambridge, where, as you heard, I did a PhD in Cambridge and then became director of studies for Christ College Cambridge. Um, and then I moved to Bristol. And I worked in Bristol for 19 years. Um, and in about 2003, um, I made what I was just describing as a terrible mistake, because previously I'd had no administrative responsibility. I had half of my time working as a doctor in a hospital, looking after patients with kidney transplants and kidney dialysis and whatnot, um, and the other half of my time doing teaching and research, and I did no administration. I refused to take part in any administration. Every time I was asked to sit on a committee, I said no. Every time I was asked to review a, a paper or a grant, I said no, because I was concentrating on my 
day job. And then in 2003, I made a terrible mistake. I publicly criticized the leadership of the department that I was working in because I thought he was screwing it up. And the boss of the university said, well, if you think you can do a better job, you better become head of department. Um, so I became head of department in 2003, um, and the rest is history. And ever since then, I've done less and less of clinical work and teaching and research and more and more administration. In uh, uh, just about, just over 10 years ago, at the end of March 2014, uh, I emigrated from uh, um, Bristol, where I was working at that time, to Hong Kong. And I worked as the president of the University of Hong Kong um, uh, in, the, in the period, as you've heard, uh, from 14 to 18. Um, I know there are some delegates from the University of Hong Kong here. I don't know, uh, where are you? Uh, where are you? Can you wave? Yeah, hooray, well done. Nice to see you. Um, I have very happy memories of my time at the University of Hong Kong. The University of Hong Kong was founded in 1911, so it's the oldest university in Hong Kong and one of the oldest in Asia. And it was founded by the British, uh, aimed to be an English-speaking university for China. That was the original mission, and it is to this day still an English-speaking university. There are eight government-funded universities in, in Hong Kong, um, but the University of Hong Kong is the only one which is both comprehensive, in other words, it has, covers all the subjects, and English speaking. Um, around the time I was there, it was regarded as the number three most international university in the world. Subsequently, it's been regarded as the number one most international university in the world. There are some interesting explanations for that statistic, but nevertheless, it is a very international university. 90% of the students in uh, the University of Hong Kong when I was there, and I think it's still true now, uh, were ethnically Chinese, about two thirds from Hong Kong and about one third from mainland China Taiwan or Macau. Um, Hong Kong is a complicated place, as those of you that work and study there will know. And during my time at the, as president of the University of Hong Kong, the complexities of Hong Kong politics were the dominant issue. So I was there in 2014 when the streets were barricaded by pro-democracy protests for 79 days. Um, and I became the intermediary between the, the various governments that were interested in it and the protesters. Uh, so that was something I hadn't really bargained for. Um, uh, and then the other thing that happened around the time I moved to Hong Kong was that the university moved from a three-year undergraduate curriculum to a four-year undergraduate curriculum, more like mainland China and more like the United States and indeed Scotland. And uh, originally the four-year undergraduate curriculum did originate in Scotland where I work now and was then exported to the US and then exported to the rest of the world. Um, uh, so that was a complicated change project, uh, which I think the University of Hong Kong managed extremely well. And we took the opportunity to radically reform some aspects of the structure of the university. So those were the two things which sort of dominated my time in Hong Kong. But I would say that Hong Kong politics uh, was easily the most challenging aspect of that job. And then uh, four years later, I did the reverse migration. But this time, instead of going to England, I went to Scotland um, to take on the role which I currently hold, which is as principal of the University of Edinburgh. So in Scotland, it's called principal. In Hong Kong, it was called president. In other parts of the world, it's called chancellor or vice chancellor, but basically the leader of the university. So I'm now at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and just to give you a few facts and figures about the University of Edinburgh, um, as I said, it was founded in 1583. It was founded significantly by the people of the town, what was at that time a town of Edinburgh. And that makes it the oldest truly civic university in the English speaking world. We're the sixth oldest university in the English speaking world. But the other five that are older than us, which is Oxford and Cambridge, St. Andrews, Glasgow and Aberdeen, were all founded by the church in some shape or form, whereas the University of Edinburgh was founded by the people of the town. So it's a truly civic university in its origins, and we're very proud of that. It's now large. We have an annual financial turnover of £1.3 billion. We have almost 17,000 staff and almost 50,000 students. Um, about a quarter of our students are from Scotland about another quarter from the rest of the UK, and 50% are from outside the UK, um, representing about 160 countries. Prior to Brexit, we used to consider European students the same as, uh, as Scottish students. They've got the same uh, category of, uh, of, of tuition fees. But with Brexit, European students become overseas students. So now we just distinguish between the UK and everybody else. So half of our population of students is from outside the UK. We were one of the first universities to pioneer MOOCs, massive open online courses, and we have over two and a half million uh, people enrolled on our MOOCs. So as well as the 50,000 students we have uh, studying directly at the University of Edinburgh, we have another 2.8 million studying indirectly teaching materials from 
the University of Edinburgh. Um, and then the other figures there that you see are just quantifying our net assets and our economic impact to the economy, which we quantified uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the University of Edinburgh is proudly very international and very interdisciplinary, but we try to be relevant to our local community and our regional community, as well as to international communities. So it's very much an internationally minded organization. And I don't personally consider relevance to your local community and relevance internationally as being in competition. I think they're exactly aligned. And so we're very keen to try and be both locally and internationally relevant. So um, on to some definitions then. So leadership is difficult to define. There's a huge literature on the topic of leadership. And I know you've got other speakers in the course of the next few days, some of whom I'm going to stay and listen to because I want to learn from them as well. Um, they will give you their definitions of leadership. But leadership is hard to define. I like this uh, quote, and I've been unable to find out who originally said it, although it's often used in the, in the leadership literature. Um, but leadership's hard to define, but you recognize it when you see it. When you see somebody uh, delivering leadership, you know what that means. You recognize it. But how do you actually define what it means? And I know people have tried, and I'll have, I'll have an attempt myself. But um, I give a, I'm going to give you a personal example. So recently, uh, my father-in-law, my wife's father, died uh, at a very advanced age and was looked after for the last part of his life in a terminal care home, so a hospice, a place where people go to spend the last periods of their lives. And the woman in charge of this hospice was called Paula. I'm not going to give her surname for reasons of confidentiality, but she was amazingly inspiring. And you could just sit and just, I was visiting my father-in-law, but you could just sit and watch her working. The way she interacted with her colleagues, the way she was calm in the face of tension and pressures and emergencies, uh, the way she uh, was authoritative when she needed to be, but also compassionate when she needed to be. I thought she was completely remarkable. And I remember saying to my wife's family at the time, her, their, their, we were very fortunate that he was being looked after in a place that was led by such a significant leader. Now, she's in a small organization. It's a small um, palliative care uh, facility in the west of England. Um, but she's providing really significant leadership. So here's an example of recognizing it when you see it. I'd love to um, uh, make contact. Um, maybe I will. I haven't, at the moment, it's still all a bit too raw because it was only quite recent. But sometime I'm going to make contact with her because I thought she was very inspiring. And I think she could teach leadership to other people just by her example. So you see these things all the time and you can learn from them. This is a point I've already made. I think leadership can be taught, but it needs to be learned. And this is a very important distinction. So um, in general, it applies to teaching. I mean, I, I was introduced as a teacher and I, I am proud of those teaching awards that I've won in my career because I enjoy, my, I enjoy teaching. I still do some teaching. I enjoy my subject, which is medicine, particularly kidney medicine. Um, but teachers are no use unless people are willing to learn. And so the best teachers inspire people to want to learn. And I think the same applies to leadership. So yes, you can be taught leadership. There are things you can learn, but you have to be willing to learn those lessons. Otherwise, uh, you are barren ground for your teachers. There are many, many examples of leadership development programs. I guess all of your countries will offer leadership development programs. There are many international ones. You're already here because you're on a leadership development program. Um, I did one many years ago in an organization called the Leadership Foundation, which is based in London in the UK and provides uh, leadership training for people in universities, mostly in universities, mostly universities in the UK. And I did this um, program a number of years ago, and I feel I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about other people. Some of those people I still remain very closely in contact with, so you do form bonds with people when you attend these kinds of programs, as you will, I hope, uh, with other delegates attending uh, USLS. Um, I learned about mistakes because they gave us some examples of when things go wrong and how to try to avoid them. You can't always avoid mistakes, but if you don't manage to avoid them, you can at least learn from them. So there's a great deal of learning, I think, about yourself, about other people, about how to interact with other people, but also about how to learn from your experience, both good and bad. So learn when things go well, but also learn when things go badly. And sometimes you can actually learn more useful lessons from things that go badly. So um, I, when I was thinking about this presentation, I had a bit of a Google search, and I looked around for some other leadership programs that I didn't know anything about. And I'm only just going to pick one. And this is not because I've got any interest, any vested interest, or any previous connection with this program. But I came across this program in Austin, Texas, in the United States, 
run by an organization called the Holdsworth Center, which I'd never heard of before. And they run programs for the potential principals of school districts. So it's a bit like the Leadership Foundation program that I did uh, in the UK a number of years ago. And the striking thing about this program was that they, their whole program is built around the definition of leadership. So there's a whole leadership development program built on trying to understand what leadership is because it is difficult to define. And they do it in this way because they say that it builds ownership, the definitions, it shapes the culture that these people are going to be working in, and it aligns talent systems within these school districts so that they have a cohort of people who have similar shared understandings, which they've sort of co-created. And I thought that was rather clever. So the program works collaboratively, and uh, Janice mentioned this word collaboration early on, it's extraordinarily important. Collaboration, uh, in this case, to engage people via what they call a listening tour. So the first part of the program is going around and listening to people, listening to the people that you're gonna be working with and you're gonna be leading, trying to understand what bothers them, what uh, interests them, what drives them and motivates them, and what problems they have, and then develops leadership definitions that everyone can contribute to. So this is a shared creation of definitions and then defines the changes that are needed and the challenges that need navigating. I thought this program sounded really sensibly constructed. I'm not recommending that everybody goes and signs on to the Holdsworth Center because you'll be, they'll, they'll be overwhelmed. But here's an example of a properly constructed leadership program, and there are many, many around the world. If I had to recommend a textbook of leadership, it would be this. Um, this book by Nelson Mandela, or about Nelson Mandela, entitled The Long Walk to Freedom, is intended to be an autobiography, and it is a story about his life and his, his struggles against apartheid. But as a textbook of leadership, I think it's without rival. So there are many, many textbooks of leadership, but I'd recommend reading this book and learning from one of the world's great men. So leadership is often thought about as the same thing or closely related to shouldn't feel that they have to change everything. Some leaders are required to maintain something that's already excellent. So leadership can be about maintenance of excellence. It doesn't have to be about change. And I've taken on two significant leadership uh, roles in my last uh, 11 or 12 years. First of all, at the University of Hong Kong, and second at the University of Edinburgh. And both cases, both times, I had to ask myself, what does this organization need? Does it need change, or does it need continuity? Does it need stability? What does it need? You have to think about what the organization needs. Some leaders, especially when they're appointed to new senior jobs, feel the need to change for change's sake in order to make their mark. Um, that's a mistake in my view. So you should analyze whether change is necessary before you try to drive it. Think about what you want to deliver and how you want to deliver it in any leadership role. This can be any leadership role, no matter how big or small. Um, and importantly, think about who and what you need to help you. Nobody, and again, this was mentioned, I think, earlier on by Janice, that no one can lead on their own. And anyone that thinks they can is doomed to failure. The idea that you can do everything yourself and you know all the answers is a recipe for disaster. So you need to think who else is going to help you and what you need in terms of training, facilities, uh, infrastructure, or anything else to help you to deliver whatever it is you want to deliver. You'll read about all these things, creating a vision, the first 100 days. Where do you want the organization or you personally to be in one, two, or five years? These questions get asked at interviews all the time, including by people like me sometimes. Um, but actually, leadership, I think, is really quite simple. It's about making decisions and, importantly, about taking responsibility for them. You can't have one without the other. So, yes, it sometimes is about change. Sometimes it's about maintenance of stability. But whatever it is, it's about making decisions and taking responsibility for them. And I, I don't propose to talk uh, any further about my background in healthcare, um, but I think as a medical practitioner, which I was for a number of years, uh, this kind of idea that you, take, you make decisions, uh, sometimes based on inadequate information, and then you take responsibility for them, that's very familiar to me from my medical background. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, quite a lot of people in university leadership have healthcare backgrounds. I also have a, um, a phrase that I often use, which is that leadership is lonely. I think there's no question that leadership can be lonely. When something goes well, everyone will want to share responsibility and ownership of it, or maybe even claim it for themselves. 
But when something goes badly, you'll be on your own. Oh, it was Peter's idea. I never thought it was a good idea. He was the one that pushed that. So that happens a lot. So be prepared to share credit and be prepared to take blame. There's a big discussion about whether leadership in a crisis is easier or harder than leadership in normal, quiet, stable times. I actually find it quite hard to remember any normal, quiet, stable times. Most of my last 20 years of my life has been involved in one crisis or another. Um, but is it easier or harder? Um, there's a school of thought that it's easier because people don't know all the answers and they're willing for somebody to take the lead and to try to um, lead whatever it is, the organization or a group of people that they're talking about. Um, but also the uh, consequences of getting it wrong in a crisis can be very much more severe. So I think it's probably easier to be a top-down leader in a crisis situation. Um, uh, but you have to remember that sometimes information is scarce, and so therefore you're needing to make decisions and, 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 and policies and, and approaches to uh, the particular challenges without having the full information about what you need to know. And also the stakes are higher if it goes wrong. And the classic example is the COVID pandemic. I mean, there have been many, many examples. But during the COVID pandemic, I was the principal of the University of Edinburgh. I'd been in the job about a year or so when the pandemic, or maybe a year and a half when the pandemic uh, arrived. And um, we didn't know how bad it was going to be, how long it was going to last, what the implications for the university would be. I told you that 50% of my students come from outside the UK. So suddenly there's no international travel. So can those students no longer come? Well, how are we going to provide teaching to students that are stuck in their own countries? How are we going to look after everybody's welfare and the students and staff that are there? How are we going to make sure that the pandemic is understood and managed? All of these things were challenges to universities and leadership during the COVID pandemic was undoubtedly different to leadership from outside the pandemic. Now, whether it was easier or harder, people disagree, but, there were, but it was definitely different. And so there are lots and lots of examples, and I can talk about more of those in questions if anybody wants to. So I was asked to talk about, um, about compassionate leadership. And I have two or three slides just to define what uh, I understand by compassionate leadership. So um, there are a number of uh, references on my slides. Don't, please don't feel you need to take photographs or write them down, because I'll happily provide the slides for people, for anyone that wants them, so you can get the references. This is a review by Ramachandran, just published last year, which it's a, quite, it's a systematic review, so it's a review of the literature on compassionate leadership. It's a very good article, and it talks about compassionate leadership being an interpersonal process involving the noticing, feeling, and sense-making in situations and in ways that connect with others. So it's about being sensitive to the needs and wishes, the strengths and weaknesses of others in various different situations. That's basically the, the, the definition of compassionate leadership that Ramachandran came up with. And it also makes the point that compassionate leadership is not a soft option. This doesn't mean um, no difficult decisions are made or no tough actions are taken, but it means that those actions are taken while simultaneously caring for people's feelings and their well-being. That's both the people in the organization and the people affected by whatever decisions are being made. So um, that's a useful set of starting definitions for compassionate leadership. Um, Ramachandran's work is also cited in this article, which is by Harrison Jones, which is a very good um, editorial. Um, and they talk about six characteristics of compassionate leadership, drawn largely from the work of Ramachandran. So those six characteristics I won't describe in any detail, but they are empathy, openness and communication, physical and mental health and well-being, so concern for the physical and mental health and well-being of the leaders themselves and of everyone that's in the organization, inclusion, integrity and respect not miles away from the um, six characteristics was it five or six characteristics that Janice uh, outlined for Ubuntu earlier on but these are the characteristics of compassionate leadership in the view of these authors the uh, uh, re that editorial describes the fact that compassionate leadership has its origins in the health sector and I told you my background is in health and so this is sort of quite familiar to me and I like the title of this book, which says, there is no health care, sorry, without compassion, there is no health care. So in other words, compassion is a critical part of health care. And health care professionals looking after people and their loved ones at a time of illness or disease or injury 
should have compassion. If they don't, healthcare is in trouble. Um, and the point of this book was talking about the way in which technology runs the risk of being run by machine, healthcare run by machines rather than by human beings, and therefore the risk that compassion might be uh, in jeopardy. And interestingly, the literature on compassionate leadership now extends well beyond the healthcare sector. And this is a good review in the Harvard Business Review, talking about uh, the role of compassionate leadership in business. And you'll see that the title of this article is Compassionate Leadership is Necessary but Not Sufficient. So in other words, compassion is an important part of leadership, but it's not enough on its own. And they produce, you don't need to look at this in detail again, as I can provide these slides to you, but they produce a thing called the Wise Compassion Leadership Matrix. So from left to right on the slide, um, you'll see um, that it goes uh, from uh, ignorance to wisdom, and from the bottom to the top, it goes from indifference to compassion. And you basically want to be in the yellow group, top right-hand corner, uh, where there's wise compassion, getting tough things done in a human way, and these leaders deliver the best results. They balance their concern for people whilst being efficient. In all the other three quadrants, there's a problem of some sort, either not enough compassion or not enough wisdom. So this is the uh, last slide on that uh, Harvard Business Review, but they talk about compassion, uh, the definition being the quality of having positive intentions and real concern for others. So it's not rocket science, this. This is just being a leader that understands the needs of others, whether they are your colleagues, your fellow leaders in other places, or the people that are uh, being affected by your policies and your decisions. And compassion can help to create stronger connections between people, uh, in order, and they make the point, as I said, that compassion is not enough on its own. You also need to have wisdom and effectiveness. Uh, and they gather data from a number of leaders in a number of countries in order to draw those conclusions. They argue in favor of mind mindfulness. Many of you will know what mindfulness means. So regular mindfulness uh, activities, which increase wise compassion. They, 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 their goal is to achieve wise compassion um, because these practices make people more self-aware and more aware of the emotions of others. And they talk about some ways to develop compassion, have more self-compassion, look after yourself in the same way that you expect others to look after themselves. Check your intentions, ask yourself, how can I be of best benefit to, this, to these people or this person? And adopt what they call a daily compassion practice. So practice what you preach. So compassionate leaders are perceived as stronger and more competent in the eyes of those authors. Um, there's another uh, a couple of articles I'm going to refer to. I won't read all these slides out because there's a lot of text on these slides, but this is an article by Perkovos that looked at the strengths and weaknesses of compassionate leadership. So amongst the strengths, this article argues that employees are more satisfied and show higher commitment to their organization. Team performance is better, relationships are better, turnover of employees is, is reduced, and there's increased citizenship. So lots of uh, abilities to navigate challenges and changes more effectively. So there's uh, a list of the examples of benefits. It also claims that there are benefits for lowering heart rate and blood pressure and strengthening the immune system. I have my doubts about those claims, but um, nevertheless, it sounds like in these authors' minds, uh, compassionate leadership is a good thing and customer service is improved. There are also some weaknesses. Compassionate leaders may be seen as being too soft or lenient, and that leads to perceptions of weak authority and this can result in difficulties in making decisions or enforcing them. And there's a risk of burnout. And they talk about something called compassion fatigue, which can occur when leaders are overwhelmed by the emotional demands of supporting their team. So in other words, compassion overload, if you like, amongst the, the leaders. And this has a potential for inefficiency and might slow things down and make decisions more difficult. And this phrase, compassion fatigue, is relevant to universities. There's a recent article in the Times Higher Education Supplement, which is a British uh, uh, publication, which I think gets international attention. This is an article by Andrew Wounds, and the title was Compassion Fatigue is Limiting Academics' Ability to Care for Students. And what he says is, again, I won't read it out, but he says that educators are overloaded with demands and overloaded with the expectation of compassion, and it's becoming counterproductive. And there's a risk that leaders can't provide the compassion even if they want to because they're exhausted and they, they have too many demands upon their time. And I'll refer to that again in a minute. I wanted to say something about cultural context and I'm very conscious that there's a risk here of cultural stereotypes and I don't want to fall into that trap. 
Um, but there is a, a literature on the cultural context around leadership in general and also around compassionate leadership. And it suggests that Western cultures are more indiv individualistic. So compassionate leadership is appreciated, but it's got to be balanced with respect for individual goals and aspirations in some Western cultures, including the one in which I currently work. Whereas what they call collectivist cultures, which apply more to this part of the world, to Latin America and to Africa, are more focused on group harmony and community and compassionate leadership might be seen as undermining authority if it's not balanced with a respect for hierarchy. So there are some cultural differences in the ways in which compassionate leadership can be seen. They talk about something called uncertainty avoidance, and they describe some cultures, and they particularly focus on Nordic countries and Singapore as being countries where there is what they call low uncertainty avoidance. So in other words, um, willingness to tolerate uncertainty, if you like. And, um, and that um, uh, is a, an area where compassionate leadership fits well. And then there are high uncertainty avoidance cultures like Greece, Japan, uh, which uh, apparently, according to these authors, have a preference for clear rules and stability. And so compassionate leadership there needs to be carefully structured and consistent. So there may be some cultural context that need to be thought about for all the different cultures in which you work. And then there's a distinction between so-called masculine and feminine cultures. Now, this uh, literature is a bit out of date, and I think probably things have changed since this was written. But they describe cultures like Japan, Hungary, Austria, Venezuela, Italy, Switzerland, and possibly the UK as having masculine cultures, which emphasize competitiveness, achievement, and success. Of those cultures, the country I know well is the UK. And I would say that masculinity of leadership culture is still present in the UK, but is changing. It's changing fast appropriately. They describe feminine cultures as particularly Sweden, Norway, Netherlands and Denmark, where there's more overlap in social gender roles and feminine cultures uh, prioritize care, quality of life and work-life balance. Again, I think that's a rather dangerous stereotype, but nevertheless, there may be some cultural context that needs to be taken into account. That's the reference for much of this literature. It's 20 years out of date now, um, but it's still often quoted. And then finally, uh, they talk about power distance. And this is uh, the, the distance between power, so-called power, and uh, the, the coal face, if you like, the real workers. Um, and the, uh, they talk about the difference between Western Europe and Australia, where there's a, a low power distance with the hierarchical structures being less pronounced and more egalitarian relationships. And here, compassionate leadership maybe is well received as compared to high power distance cultures, which they characterize as many Asian and Middle Eastern countries where hierarchical structures are more rigid. So um, uh, again, I think, I don't want to overinterpret the cultural context, but in summary, there's a suggestion in Western uh, individualistic and low power distance cultures, compassionate leadership is more likely to be embraced, but needs to be balanced with respect for individual goals and autonomy. Whereas in collectivist high power distance cultures, it may need to be adapted to represent uh, hierarchical norms and group harmony. So I asked myself, am I a compassionate leader? And the answer is I try to be, but I recognize that I'm imperfect at it. My background in healthcare, I think, helps. I draw on that in my leadership. Um, I think there's lots of areas in which I need to improve, uh, and I still regard myself as a work in progress, even though I'm now uh, old. Um, uh, I think getting work-life balance right is a challenge to all leaders, um, and setting examples to the people that you're working with uh, remains a challenge. I'm not good about sending emails and WhatsApps out of hours. I don't expect people to necessarily reply, but I often think I do. And so I recognize that I need to do work on that. I need to work on in delegation and empowerment. And I need to work on what I've called practicing versus preaching. And I wanted to highlight something about the so-called uh, golden rule of practicing what you preach. I'll show you a slide on that in a second. I said I'd mentioned compassion for leaders. So leadership roles are often real, well rewarded. Um, and they come with uh, financial rewards, but also prestige and influence. But they can be lonely jobs. And you've seen phrases like, it's tough at the top, it goes with the territory, if you don't like the heat, get out of the kitchen. This sort of phrase is often used to leadership roles. Support structures are really important from your peers, from your partners, and from your mentors. And I'll, in some of my advice, which I'll give you in a second, I refer to that. I think transparency, honesty, and clarity are essential. I think if you don't have these things, as well as compassion, then your leadership is likely to be challenged. And I think, and I've said this before, leaders can only realistically expect compassion from others if they deploy it themselves. 
Um, and this is the thing called the golden rule. So I don't know if you know what the golden rule is. This is something that I'd sort of heard of, but when I was thinking about what I was going to talk to you about, I came across an interesting slide about this. So the golden rule um, is something which I was taught uh, when I was growing up, which is treat other people in the way that you would wish to be treated yourself. This applies to compassionate leadership as it does to all sorts of other uh, characteristics of leadership. But this is relevant to cultural context because I came across this table which shows you that every major religion has a version of this assertion that you should treat other people in the way that you expect to be treated yourself. So do unto others as you would have done unto you. Do you know, Practice what you preach. Live your values and your intentions and your practices. Don't just impose them on other people unless you can exemplify them yourself. And I think this is a very good golden rule for leadership. Going back to compassion fatigue, this article in the Times Higher, um, this, was, this article finished with this quote here, leaders must be committed to cultivating a compassionate culture and building trust in the workplace by personally modeling how managers should behave to create an inclusive and empowered work environment. So if you want compassion from the people that you're working with and you're leading, uh, then express it yourself and otherwise uh, you can't expect anybody else to express it towards you. I have eight minutes left on my timer. I think I've got two more uh, categories to talk about. One is when leadership goes wrong. I'm only going to do this very uh, briefly, but I've seen in my career many examples of leadership going wrong. Sometimes it's individuals and sometimes it's institutions. Sometimes the failure of an individual, particularly if they're in a very significant leadership position, can lead to the failure of an institution. This can apply to businesses, it can apply to universities, it can apply to countries. And so uh, leadership, can, leadership failure can have major consequences. In my experience, leadership failure is often mostly about failure of judgment. Now, obviously, there are people who get into leadership positions who are just incompetent and can't deliver, and there are other people who get into leadership positions who are criminals or frauds, and obviously they, in, in due course, will usually fail themselves. But most of the leadership failures that don't involve criminality or incompetence are about failures of judgment. So leadership requires judgment. And when you exercise judgment, you have to be prepared to calibrate the outcomes. So in other words, if something looks like it's going wrong, don't keep making the same decisions again. I've seen that so many times. Cases where errors of judgment are repeated or compounded and the situation just gets worse and you get a spiral out of control. So sometimes it's not a single uh, error of judgment, sometimes it's a catalogue of errors of judgment that get people into trouble. A former politician in the UK called Enoch Powell famously said that all political careers end in failure. I quite like that phrase. Um, he didn't actually just say that, he said unless they have particularly beneficial circumstances during their career, some political careers end in success, but the majority of political careers end in failure. And this is uh, borne out time and time again uh, if you look at politicians' careers around the world. And the other phrase I like is uh, from George Santayana. It's often uh, attributed either to Edmund Burke or to Winston Churchill, but in fact it's George Santayana who said it originally, and he said various versions of this phrase, but whoever fails to learn from the mistakes of history is doomed to repeat them. So learn from history, learn from what other people have done, and learn from uh, where things went well and where things went badly. And then my final category is to just give you briefly some advice, and I'm very happy to expand on any of this if people want to. So prepare yourself. Prepare yourself as an individual with your own skills, your own goals, your own ambitions. Understand yourself. Think about your values. Think about what drives you. Think about what motivates you. And think about what you want to deliver in any kind of leadership role. And then think about what skills you need in order to do that. Do you already have those skills or not? If not, go and try and acquire them. If you do have them, try and further develop them. This is a central message for me. Recognize that you'll need help and support. Find one or more mentors. I think the role of mentorship is grossly underplayed. So having somebody that you um, can discuss things with, that you can rely on, someone whose judgment you trust, you don't necessarily have to agree with them all the time, but someone with valuable experience and, and expertise that you can be in contact with that provides a very significant uh, role to any leader, either established or developing. And I actually think the mentors should best be from outside your organization. Somebody distant, somebody uh, from a different sector or a different, even a different country that can provide you with mentorship without having any vested interests in your particular uh, role or your particular organization. 
warn your families. Um, uh, my, my family have suffered a lot from the roles that I've undertaken over the last few years. And without their support and without their uh, confidence and their, and their love, uh, leadership roles would be very much harder. So think about the people around you. Think about how they're going to be affected by leadership roles that you, that you take on and warn them because it's going to change their lives as well as yours. This is another really important message. Build a team. I've already said this, but don't think you can do it on your own. Get good quality people around you, preferably diverse people. It's well, there's lots of evidence that diverse leadership teams, both in terms of gender, race, uh, physical uh, ability or anything else, uh, are much more effective and have much better results than non-diverse teams. The business is taking a while to learn that lesson, but I think it is being learned. And when you have these teams, empower them. Trust them. Allow them to make mistakes. Don't feel that you've got to micromanage everything because you won't be able to. Um, and then the other major uh, message to you is listen to advice. Um, learn from your mistakes because you will make some. Anyone that thinks they're not going to is, is going to be disappointed. So make mistakes by all means, but learn from them and learn from the mistakes of others. I've probably learned more about leadership from watching what other people have got wrong uh, than necessarily about things that I've done well or badly myself. If you learn from uh, other people around you, other organizations, uh, you can gather very rapid experience uh, very quickly. Um, and I've already said this, if you expect compassion, compassion, practice it yourself. Observe the golden rule. Uh, do unto others as you would have done unto you. So my conclusions, therefore, and then I'm going to open it up for discussion with Janice, who's here somewhere um, over there. Uh, my conclusions are that leadership is complex to define. Compassionate leadership, I think, is a very welcome concept. It's emerged in the literature in the last few years, particularly starting, as I said, from healthcare, but actually now being applied more generally to leadership in all sorts of other contexts. And I think leadership, uh, compassionate leadership can potentially improve the outcomes, both for the leaders and for those that they are leading. I believe leadership can be taught, and it can certainly be learned, uh, including from your own experience, but also from observing others and taking account of the lessons from history. I've, I've said this repeatedly because I think this is a really important message to you, that actually there's plenty of learning material available out there. You just have to be alive to listen to it and take notice of it. Successful leadership needs planning, training, commitment, honesty, and transparency. And I also believe it needs luck. Um, you can't necessarily create your own luck, but you can certainly um, recognize it when it happens. Um, that's all I was planning to say to you. So thank you for your attention, and I welcome comments and discussion.